Okay, I've, I've put down seven, seven thoughts. One was to stand fast in the liberty of the gospel. One was to make justification in grace. Number three was to walk in the spirit. Number four was to be led by the spirit. Number five was to crucify the flesh. Number six was to demonstrate the fruit of the spirit. And number seven was to live in the spirit. And they are seven steps of what we call victorious living. And as I said, the Galatian church had left the teaching of grace and gone back to being under the law and bondage. And so let's have a look now at um, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 1. And Paul is talking to the Galatian church. Now, again, we need to understand that Paul is not talking to anybody else but to the born again believers. And this is so important because when, when he when Paul is actually talking to the church, he's trying to encourage the church, he's trying to disciple the church, he's trying to build the church up that they may be the major force that God wants them to be. And unfortunately in our world today, the church is not the major force that it should be, is it? And so Paul is saying to the Galatian church, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, do he think by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Now, Paul is quite clear here, isn't it? He's challenging the church on two issues. He's saying you can either walk by the law of the flesh, or you can walk by the Spirit or by the Holy Spirit. Now you go into John chapter 7, and this is what Jesus said. Jesus said in verse 37 of John chapter 7 and John chapter uh, and verse 38. 39, we just keep that in the context. Jesus said these words, in the, in the last day, in that great day of the feast. Now, let me just say this. People get very, very confused about when the last days were or are. The last days are not today. Because if we look into the scriptures and see what Jesus had to say, the last days started when the day of Pentecost started to come down. Right? People say we're living in, we are living in the last days, but those days started that, and that's quite clear in the scriptures. All right? So we are living in those days that Jesus was talking about, but he was also saying that those days started, the great day of the feast started when uh, Jesus was leaving. That in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit had been poured out yet, which they that believed on him should receive. 
For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, <clears throat> we know that we go into a few chapters later on in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, that was when Jesus was being glorified. He went up into heaven and the Bible says that he will come in like manner. And there is a lot of confusion. People actually say, well, we, we are living in, the, in these last days. Yes, we are living in these last days. But Jesus started to prepare the church for those last days. Now, you may not have thought about that before. But here he was talking about the Holy Spirit being poured out. And Paul carries on that same theme and he actually says to the Galatian church, he said, you were once walking in the realm of the Holy Spirit, are you now walking in the realm of the flesh? And, and the flesh and the spirit don't go together. It's impossible. And, and, and Paul says these things, he said, the things that I, I, I want to do, I don't do. But the things that I don't want to do, I do. Because there's a conflict all the time between flesh and the Holy Spirit. And Mark, you and me, when you actually decide that you're going to do some studying or you're going to go into prayer or you're going to do something that's spiritual, something will always come against you that actually will try to distract you from the realm of the Spirit. Okay? Try it. If you don't believe me, try it. Okay? Actually, you know, I've said it many, many times. The only way I can really, myself, personally, can, can do anything is when I get up and I, I've got no distractions whatsoever. I'll get up and I'll pray and I'll read and I'm ready for the morning, whatever that may throw at me. I'm no good at night, okay? Can't do my studying really at night time. I have to do it either first thing in the morning or during the course of the day where I go out of the way and, and there, there is no distractions whatsoever. But you say, you say to, to your wife or to your husband or, or, or to your partner or somebody that you're praying with, well, we're going to meet at a certain time and we'll pray. <coughs> I can guarantee you, if you don't turn your phone off, your phone will start ringing. Because we are in conflict all the time. And Paul actually says we, we need to actually get back to the teaching of grace. And Paul was talking here to the Galatian church because they had left the teaching of grace and gone back to being under the law and bondage. And again, when we go back, go further into Galatians chapter 3, and Paul continues, he said, he therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth do he by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. If you remember, I, I said that 430 years before the law was given, Abraham walked in faith. Now, if Abraham could walk in faith, 430 years before it was given, how much more should we be walking in the faith of the Word of God? He says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. If you're a child of God, according to the Scriptures, you're a child of Abraham. Alright? But if you're not walking in faith, but you're walking in the works of the law, then you can't be a child of Abraham. It's quite simple, isn't it? And the scripture foreseeing, and this is prophecy, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So all the nations were going to be blessed in Abraham because Abraham walked in faith. Now you go back into the very beginning when God called Abraham out of the country that he was in and he said I want you to go into this land and he said 
I want you to actually walk, okay, in faith. And so he took his son, okay, and he was going to sacrifice his son because he was walking in faith. And he knew, if you go back into Hebrews, you will find this, that Abraham said, even if God allows me to sacrifice my son, he can bring him back to life. Right? But he had already been given the promises, and the promises were that in his seed shall all the nations be blessed. So we can see, don't we, that Abraham was a man of faith. He was a man that God had given a wonderful promise to, and we are children of Abraham as well. Okay? Are you following that? So then, they which be of Abraham are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident that just shall live by faith. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the story of Martin Luther. And if you haven't heard, look into his, his life and, and see that he spent so much time trying to find salvation through the law. He was trying to justify it. You see, have to be careful when I say this, but when we have a look at the, at the teaching of penance and things like that, it is totally against the Word of God. You cannot, under any circumstances, earn your salvation. And Martin Luther, although it took him a long time to realise this, he eventually realised them and he nailed on the, the door, the just shall live by faith. And again, I was listening to, to somebody talking about this one day this week, and he, he actually said that Martin Luther used to beat himself so much, he would whip himself, he would do all sorts of things to actually try to earn this salvation that we have been so graciously given. Until finally somebody said to him, if you climb these stairs, there were glass, there was transparent glass, and, and on those actual stairs were the blood stains, and, and they, they actually reckon there were some of the blood stains maybe of Christ. But if you actually go up on those stairs, you will be justified. And so he started to crawl up on those stairs, on his knees bleeding and everything else, until finally <clears throat> a light, as it were, hit him. And he heard this saying, the just shall live by faith. Straight away he got up and he recognised that he could not earn his salvation. He could not keep the law. He had to walk in the realm the Spirit. Again, a lot of history, if you go back into history, you will see that the average man, the common man, would never have a Bible. It was all wrote in Latin. There would only be certain people that could read Latin, and most of the time it was the priest that kept people under bondage so much until God bless him, the king actually King James actually started to bring the Bible to the modern day person so each and every one of us could actually read the Bible in a language that we could understand and now some have gone to the extreme where they're taking parts out of the Bible and they say it doesn't mean this and it doesn't mean that and it doesn't mean the other. I was, I read the new King James personally because I, I think it's near enough what the original uh, Bible was teaching us. 
you read some of the new versions, you'll find a lot of the stuff that's in the Bible has been taken out. Now you might disagree with me. You may say, well, it's nice to read it in a modern language. Well, you know, I want to read what the Word of God has to say, not whether it's a modern language or not. Okay? And so, we continue. And it, as he said these words in, in uh, verse 11, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, of God. It is evident that just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, if you want to keep the law, go ahead, but you cannot have salvation through the law. What some of the, I'll just finish up and then I'll show you what some of the things of the, the, the law and the flesh are. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Jesus was made a curse for you and for me. And why do I know that? Because the Bible actually says, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now again, you may not know this, but as he said, the same day a criminal was executed, he was removed from the earth. Okay? They did not leave criminals on a tree because they were cursed. And that's how they used to, that's how they used to deal with people. They would hang them on a tree. And the same day that they, they were on that tree, they were actually removed. Jesus died on the tree, on the cross. Now, these people that have made these crosses, they make them nice and smooth and, uh, and everything else. But I can guarantee you that the cross that Jesus died on was nothing like that. Okay? It would never have been nice and smooth or anything like that. It would have been possibly a jagged tree stump or, or something like that. Possibly, with, yeah, it would have been those, but it would never have been the smooth thing that the painter likes to paint. When he got onto that cross, he was already busted up. His back was already broken. He was already bleeding. His flesh was already hanging out. And if you don't understand that, have a look at when the Romans used to beat somebody with a cat of nine tails, they would have big metal pieces on the end of the whip that would pull every part of the flesh out. And you tell me, as Paul is saying here, that you want to go back to serve in the flesh rather than walking in the realm of the spirit. When Jesus died so much in so much in so much agony for each and every one of us, I can never understand myself why people want to walk away from God or from Jesus. I can't understand why people who recognise what Jesus done for them want to walk away. When the big pieces of flesh are being ripped out. Think about it. Calvary is not a pleasant place. And yet we treat Calvary with such sometimes disdain. And so Paul continues and he's challenging the Galatian church and he was actually saying curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith and so when Paul actually brings this again to the, to the Galatian church he's actually saying did you receive salvation through the law or did you receive it 
through the Spirit? Are you able to serve Christ through the works of the flesh? Or are you able to serve him through the Spirit? He brought us back. We are no longer in bondage to the law. We were sold as slaves to the law and his death penalty, but the Lord has saved us. So when we understand that background, we can then go forward into Galatians again, chapter 5. And when Paul actually says, verse 16, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the works or the lusts of the flesh. If anyone claims that he can be saved and yet live in sin, God's judgment will decide whether he, that's the man, or Paul is right. I was talking to Mark Stad yesterday when we was on our own. And we were talking to the, the people who no longer actually believe in some of the biblical doctrinal truths that the Word of God preaches. There are many people now trying to take things out of the Bible and they're trying to say, well, God didn't say this. He didn't mean this. He meant something else. He doesn't mean anything but what is already wrote. And you know, I've, I've said this before, Jesus said these words. He said there were many that are going to say, Lord, we've done this, that, and the other in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Not everybody that gets to heaven is going to go into heaven. Not everybody that says they're a Christian is a Christian. How do I know when somebody is a Christian? The Bible actually says in one job that your spirit should bear witness with their spirit that they are children of God. If somebody actually comes up to me and tells me they're a Christian, straight away my spirit should witness with them. And I think you'll find that in 1 John chapter 5. Have a look at it. Not now. Have a look at it later on. But your spirit should witness with their spirit. And if your spirit doesn't witness with their spirit, put the alarm bells up. Alright? And so Paul is actually saying, when we are walking in this life that the Lord wants us to walk in, we will then show or we will manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, and then all the rest of it, which we will look at another time. One of the things, if we're walking in the Spirit, is that we should be demonstrating what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 at 13 actually says. And don't beat yourself up when you read this because we all fall short of it sometimes. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 says, Love suffereth long and is kind, love envieth not, Love vote is not itself, is not puffed up, does not believe itself, unseemly, seeketh not our own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, if you can match that, you're walking in the realm of the Spirit, if you can't match it, sometimes we're walking in the realm of the flesh. Okay? And like I said last week, a lot of us are walking in the realms of the flesh. We are supposed to live in Christian virtues, 
morality, good behaviour, good character, goodness and righteousness. I've made a, a list of some of the things that the work of the flesh actually demonstrate. And there's 17 of them, but I, I might not share them all with you, okay? 17 works of the flesh. And we, we, we know some of these things and, and we sometimes emphasise them so, so quickly. Adultery. Now we know that anybody that's in, a, in an adulterous relationship is walking in the flesh. We know that, don't we? And we know that they're, they're in sin. Fornication. Again. And, and most of what Paul is talking about, the flesh, is sexual immorality. Uncleanliness. I put it down here, what is uncleanliness? Well, it's the opposite of purity. That's really what it is, the opposite of purity. This also includes sodomy, homosexuality, people that are lesbians, beastity. You know, there are people unfortunately trying to have sex with animals and the Bible warns us so clearly about anything that is outside of a relationship with your husband or your wife. Warns us so clearly. <clears throat> and all other forms of sexual perversion. Go into 2 Peter. These are some of the works of the flesh that Paul is talking to the Galatian church about. Peter 2 Peter chapter 2 but there were false prophets also among the people even as there should be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow, follow their perilous way by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. <clears throat> and through covetousness, they which with vain words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now listen to this now. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah. Paul was actually saying to me yesterday that he's having a conversation with somebody on Facebook that have actually denied that the flood ever existed. Now these are people that are taken away from the Word of God. And I thought to myself, I wonder what he would say about the rainbow that's always in the sky when it rains and when it's sun, when it's sunshiny. He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. <clears throat> and this is what Peter's talking about, this is what Paul is talking about when he speaks to the Galatian church. Paul is talking about honesty, and purity. 
What else are the works of the flesh? Idolatry. Now, that word idolatry really means something that takes the place of God. Right? <clears throat> Did you hear that? Idolatry is something that takes the place of God. Now it can be your family, so be careful. It can be your job. It can be anything that actually takes the place of God. It's an idol. Witchcraft. Now we know as, as Christians we shouldn't be involved in any of this stuff. Should we? I was actually listening to talk radio one day this week and the guy on there was actually talking and this was 7 o'clock in the morning and it was supposed to be a sports program but he was actually saying to, to the listeners he said, and what are your star signs? You see, it's very, very subtle it comes in through the, the back door and he was saying everybody should know their star signs. Well, do you know what? I know what my star sign is. Do I ever read it? No. Why? Because it's part of witchcraft. <laughs> You've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. Any Christian that decides to have a tattoo, if you really know what tattoos are all about, it is part of witchcraft. Again, look it up by all means. How do I know that? Because the children of Israel were warned by God not to get involved in any demonic idolatry. But what did they do? They used to sacrifice their sons to the God of monarchy. It's all there in the scriptures. And so Paul is warning the Galatian church that don't get involved in anything that will add to you. Do you know what else is the work of the flesh? Strife. And the Bible actually says where there is every evil work or where there is strife, there is every evil work. Strife. When you know that somebody wants to have an argument with you, walk away. Walk away. Strife will actually bring in sin. What else does strife bring in? It brings in heresy, quarrelling, these are all works of the flesh. Envying. You know, your neighbour may have something that you haven't got. And you look at him and think, yeah, I want that. And you do all sorts of different things to actually get it. These are all parts of the flesh that we are operating in in our world today. You know, my car is, I think, 12 years old, something like that. I'm quite happy with it. Why? Because it gets me from A to B. It never causes me a problem. And I'm not going to go into a lot of debt just to get another car. See, these are some of the things that Paul is warning about. Jealousy. Envy. You would have thought, well, surely not in the church today. But it happens. People are jealous of other people within the church. Well, he's in a position of authority and he's only been in the church six months. Well, if you've been in the church six years and you've just sat there without challenging your pastor about doing anything, whose fault's that? If you're just happy to come in at quarter to eleven every Sunday, and just sit in your seat and do nothing, who's fault that? Yeah, of course we're going to be challenged. 
jealousy leads to hatred envy leads to murder I just wonder how many Christians have murdered other Christians through their own thoughts not physically but through their own thoughts I wonder how many Christians are no longer walking in fellowship with God because other Christians have said things about them instead of having the decency to go and talk to them about it. <clears throat> These are some challenging things that Paul talks about. But he's talking about to the Galatian church, which is a backslid, sex-filled church, unfortunately. And Paul had to I read Paul's epistles when he actually says these words. He says, you may think I'm weak in spirit, but he said, if I come to you, I'll come to you with more than just the discipline of the word of God. He said, you may think I'm weak, but if I turn up into your church on Sunday, I'll bring more than just a few words. I wonder today what would happen in some of our churches, if the Lord walked in, be challenging oneself. So jealousy, envy, murder, drunkenness, quarrelling, envying, heresies, strife, they are all part of the flesh. And Paul actually said we need to discipline the flesh. We need to crucify the flesh. We need to walk <clears throat> in the realm of the Spirit. And he said there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 18, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. And we know, if we go into 19, the works of the flesh, I've just then said what a lot of them are. The verse 21 says his words. He's finishing now to the Galatian church before he starts to talk about the spiritual life. Envying, murders, drunkenness, reviling, such like, of which I tell you before. Okay? So he's already told them once, hasn't he? I tell you before, as I have already told you in times past. So this is not the first time that Paul spoke to the Galatian church. As I have told you in, part, in times past, that they which do such things, listen to this now, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. No man who commits these sins will ever enter the kingdom of God unless he confesses his sin and asks the Lord to forgive him. You cannot walk in sin and expect to get to heaven. It's not going to happen. All right? So Paul said that all these things, that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you want to inherit the kingdom of God, walk in the realm of the Spirit. I'm not saying to you that you've got to be clouds in the sky and everything else. There are times when you will be challenged. There are times when I am challenged. There are times when the flesh will come in. But we need to understand that. And we need to just go and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Because not everybody that talks to you will always be nice, will they? <laughs> there are some people that I would love to avoid, but sometimes I can't. They're not always going to be nice, but when we make mistakes, let us just go to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I'm sorry. 
pour essayer de venir. Il n'y a pas un track qui en vaut pour, pour une relationship. Next week, we're going to have a look at the walk of the spiritual life. Now, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot that we're going to look at, but the only way that we can actually walk in the way of the Holy Spirit is to allow the fruit of the Holy Spirit to work in our life. And I'll close by saying this. If five years ago, Things that are bothering you, I'll rephrase that. If things that are bothering you today were the same things that were bothering you five years ago, you have an issue that needs to be sorted. Whether it's anger, whether it's rebellion, whether it's somebody that you haven't forgiven, whatever it is, if you can look back and think five years ago, or ten years ago, or even two weeks ago, or even yesterday. If there's something that's bothering you from that period of time, you need to come to the throne of grace. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please deal with it. And until that's dealt with, you can never really develop in your relationship with God. Well, there's a man for you now, but not what I'm talking about. All right? The challenge. The Christian life is a challenge. Please don't challenge me too much, but it is a challenge. Okay? So let's develop our relationship. Let's develop our walk with God. Now, I haven't brought this to beat anybody. I haven't brought this to condemn anybody. I'm just trying to bring it so you will understand some of the issues that you're talking to, to the Galatian church about, and say, I recognize, I recognize that that part of me that needs to be dealt with. I recognise that maybe I've got an anger issue that needs to be dealt with. Maybe I've got a, a, a pride issue that needs to be dealt with. Let's deal with it and move forward. Father, thank you for the ministry of your word. I pray, Lord, that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of you. We thank you, Lord, that as Paul wrote, Lord, to the Galatian church and challenged the Galatian church to walk in the realm of the spirit, not in the realm of the flesh, that we will do, Lord, that, Lord, that we will work, walk more and more in the realm of the spirit, that, Lord, we will discipline ourselves and help us, Lord, to, Lord, be the people that you would have us to be. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful week that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for bringing us safely here, Lord, this morning. We just pray, Lord, minister, strengthen, encourage. Bless, Lord, this week for each and every one. Lord, we'll have a fantastic week, Lord. Lord, whether things go right or wrong, Lord, we will just look to you and trust you in everything that we do, Father. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.